Okay, thank you to those who have joined us so far. I'm sure people are still going to keep joining. Um, first, I want to welcome Rabbi Sam Frankel and thank him for, for this presentation tonight. Rabbi Frankel is going to present for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. Um, I do believe there is a way for you to raise your hands. And, uh, and I'll be able to see that and then I'll call on you and Rabbi Frankel will answer your questions. Rabbi Frankel, the floor is yours. Shalom Aleichem everybody. Thank you for joining. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I think the people who took out their time now to be able to spend this next 45 minutes to an hour to be able to hear about tefillah I really feel like I'm preaching to the choir. My goals today are just a couple. I, I want to be able to help Davening come into a little different perspective. I want to talk about the relationship between Davening as a Yachid and Davening as a Tzibor. When I first prepared this, I never thought I would be talking to people who have been Davening now as a Yachid for so long, and we haven't been able to Daven as a Tzibor. There was not at all a plan when I started talking about this. Before I start, I'm going to tell you, I want to put it into a historical perspective as well. But I need to begin with a few thanks. A couple of neshamos that I want to make a zecher to, and refuah shalemos to everybody who needs, and then we'll begin. Firstly, I want to give a thanks to two people out front. Rabbi Rothwax, who has been an enormous inspiration throughout this entire time. Um, and, and I don't think I would have been able to do this without his support. Uh, I find that he has been talking more about mindfulness lately than I have. Uh, and what he has been doing has been really a source of inspiration for all of us. He's given me materials that have helped prepare me for this talk. And the second person I want to thank is a member of our shul, Alan Friedman, who gave material to Rabbi Rothwax and spent time speaking with me to help me put this into the context that I think we need to. There are three neshamos that I want to mention, and unfortunately we have lost so many from the time that I prepared. But all of the neshamos, my hope is that if anybody can take something from today's talk and bring it in to improve your davening, may the schar for that be a zecha to those neshamos. The three people I'm mentioning, and I'm mentioning only their names, and Hamev and Yovin, those people will know. Reb Yosef Shmuel Shmelka ben Yitzchak, Kalman ben Chaim, and Ziska ben Yaakov. Now, I've put some of what I'm talking about on YouTube, so if people want to follow this up and supplement it, there are things on YouTube as well. And I want to give a refor shalema to all of those people right now who need it and that this should be a zecher for them as well, to be able to help them repair. When I started talking to Rabbi Rothwax three months ago about this, he said, you know, it sounds interesting. He said, do you have a title? And I thought in a second, I didn't really, and I said, well, how does this sound? Chazoras Hashatz, a rabbinic modification that has outlived its usefulness. Not. And all of a sudden, the phone went dead. I didn't hear him for five seconds, 10 seconds. And I say, Rabbi, are you there? And he says, Sam, I, 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 I'm not sure I like that title. Come up with a better title and then give me a call. So it took me another month or two to fine tune this. And I called him back and I said, Rabbi, I think I got another title. How does this sound? Why do we repeat Chazor Sashats? Didn't Hashem hear us the first time? He says, yeah, I like that better. That's good. And then I said, I'm going to add a little caveat to it. It's going to be entitled also, How Mindfulness Impacts Our Prayer and How Praying Impacts Our Mind. If there's any time in history that we need to be able to help shape the way we think, it's right now. Being able to live in this moment and to be able to take it in a way, we need prayer more than ever. I used to live by a guiding principle that the thought's what counts. You all heard that saying? Oh, it's the thought that counts. That used to be one of my guiding principles. 
I used to think as long as I had good intention in what I'm doing, just go for it. I didn't worry about reaction. It was the thought that counts. But boy, I learned the lesson from my daughter, my oldest daughter and my oldest granddaughter, that that's not true. It's not the thought that counts. Bein adam lechaveiro and bein adam lamakom, it's the effect of our actions that count. The only place in life that the thought that counts matters is in prayer. That's the only time that it's the thought that counts. And my feeling is that davening will become more meaningful when we're able to understand a little bit more meaning of what the words mean. I can't tell you how many people I've been talking to, people who come from families of Rabbanim who've been davening for years, and they have a very poor concept of what the words to davening means. And part of what I'm going to do is give you an illustration of how over the last few months, by paying attention to the words, how all of a sudden davening has taken on a whole new meaning. Now, when I spoke to the rabbi and I got material from Alan Friedman, one of the things that I found out about was that this whole concept of davening, it's something that's really inherent in human nature. The Gemara has a whole mach locus about is davening me, although, is it something that comes from our forefathers, or is it something that originates from the Karbanot? And I believe that both of those are very evident in the Dominic. I think that for us as people, as Jews specifically, but I think all people need to pray. I think religions all over the world pray. Frankly, I think people who don't believe in God even pray. Prayer is something that's inherent to the human spirit. We as Jews take it to a whole different level. But prayer is something that's important. Our Ovo did it. We had people like Hannah, Miriam. Prayer is something that as individuals we've been doing from the very beginning of time. But where did it come that all of a sudden we do it together? And this concept of tzibor, where does that come from? So that I believe may come more from the Karbanot. When we had a Beit HaMikdash and we all got together as a tzibor that's when all of a sudden we started relying on each other. Where all of a sudden, if I did a sin, I need to bring the karban. I needed to have a sholiach. He was called a kohen. I couldn't do it on my own. I needed to have somebody else take this animal, sacrifice it, realizing in my head that that really should be me. You know how impactful that is? You think I'd be answering a cell phone then or talking to a friend? When I gave over that animal, and I saw the Kohen spit and the blood be poured, I was probably crying. Imagine if we can bring that emotion into davening today. As a teamwork, if we can realize what the impact of davening really means and how to bring able to incorporate that. So that's the concept of bringing in the notion of what it means to be a teamwork. Now, one of the things that I learned, and I want to thank somebody else right now, Rabbi Fight. Dr. Fight, who mentioned the following. He says, when we come together as a minion, this is something we have not been doing now for weeks already. I can't tell you the things that we have been missing by not being able, you know it all. Things like Kaddish, people who are mourners. I've, I get calls every day from people who, who, who miss the davening. And, and the notion is, is that when we get together as a tzibor, we need to appreciate it. I think HaKadosh Baruch Hu in giving us this, one of the YouTube videos that I put up is called Corona Timeout. I believe that this isn't just happening now by chance. If you are a parent and you look down and you saw the way your children were acting, I think HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if you looked, I looked at the news from a month ago, everything on the news was about crime after crime after crime. Young people hitting old people, people doing things to police officers. You remember the chaos that we were living in a month ago? It's not happening now, because everybody's locked in your rooms. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving us a time out now. He's telling us, go back home, because you can't get along with each other. So you might as well sit at home, and I think we can use this time to be able to find out what the words of davening mean, so we can actually enhance it. One of the things that inspired me to do this talk was for a few months I was going into shuls and I was looking at the way people were doing, doing Chazor HaShashatz. During the time when the Chazan was repeating the Shmon Esrei, why was he doing it? 
Everybody else just davened. Why is he repeating it? And the truth of the matter is, when you look around shul, you sort of wonder. It seems a little redundant, no? People are on their cell phones. Some people are talking to each other. Some people even think it's okay to take out a safer. And what Dr. Fight taught me, he said, you know what the Rub said? There's a difference between an individual davening b'tzibor and the difference between the chazin who is acting on behalf of the tzibor. When I come into shul and I help make the minion, I'm one of 10 people. And I now, when I daven Shemona Esrei, I'm davening that as a yochid. Yeah, I'm davening in a plural, I'm saying Rafainu, but the truth of the matter is in my heart, I'm thinking about my sick people, my family, my parnasa, because it's a, it's a yochid, davening. When the chazin gets up afterwards as a sholiach, tzibor, what is he doing different than me? So the Rav said that when a person davens alone, that's what's called tefillah b'tzibor. But when you're davening as a chazin, that's called tefillah hatzibor. He is now davening on behalf of the congregation. Our job during that time is not to check my schedule and what I have to do after davening, to see if I'm going to be late for my bus so I can take off my tefillin. My job is to stand there and to listen to what the chazan is doing, because now this is all about the community. And when I don't do that, what we're actually doing is we're turning our backs on the kihila, and I believe on the shrine as well. And my purpose today is to be able to help us when we come back finally from davening the yechidus, that we shouldn't be looking at our watches as much as we should be looking at the sitter. We should be able to come in and to recognize that this is a special time. I used to call this, I told the first talk that the rabbi let me do, I referred to Beth Aaron. I said, I want this room to be a mindfulness gym. And I saw the face on the rabbi and I said, no, 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 don't come in in sneakers and shorts. It's a different kind of a gym. When you come in to Davin, this is a gift. You have built in three times a day a chance to be able to train your mind to focus on now. You know how hard that is to do? It takes practice. We have to do that every single day, three times a day, to get it right. So that when I finally walk outside, I can act differently than when I walked inside. But I think how Kodesh Baruch Hu saw what was going on, and he said, you can't daven together as a tzibor. You need to go back to your homes, figure out what we're saying. And I'm going to give you a few examples now of some of the things that I have come to see. When I started talking about mindfulness, you know what my biggest fear was? Does this jive with Judaism? Is this a new fangled thing that I'm bringing in that maybe it may not be so good? Two years ago, I got a call from a psychologist out of Far Rockaway in an area called Bayswater. He wanted to bring mindfulness into the yeshivas there, and he was getting flack from all the principals. He, I asked him why. He said they did a little research and it always came back, Buddhism, Buddhism, Buddhism. I, they thought it was Avodah this mindfulness. Can you help me with that? I said, let me tell you something. Buddhists meditate. I said, do they eat? Is it also to eat? Do they breathe? Is it also to breathe? I said, they learn how to meditate. They get known for that. It doesn't mean that meditation is also. All that mindfulness means is training your brain to stay in the moment. Because in the past, that's where depression lives. In the future, that's where anxiety lives. In the present, that's where mental health lives. When I started talking about this, one of the things that attracted me to mindfulness is that it's the only form of mental health that's proactive. Every single form of mental health is reactive. You get kicked out of school, you get sent to a social worker. He can't help you go to a psychiatrist because you're medicine. They can't help you in a hospital, you're shocked to it. Everything is reactive. Mindfulness is the only form of mental health that gives you tools to be able to cope with situations like now where we need it more than ever. But it doesn't just happen. The same way when you practice the piano or you go into the gym to be able to get your abs strong. When you go into shul, you're going there to practice 
keeping your mind in the moment to stay focused on what you're saying. That's hard to do because I guarantee you, and I know what it was like. It's easy for me now. I'm retired. I remember when I worked at Yavna, I was the first guy to take my palace off because I had to run out to get to school. I know what it was like, but I also know what it's like now. After seeing what it means to be able to live in the moment, I talk slower, I move slower, and I'm doing more now than I did at any point in my life. Figure that out. It's an amazing thing to be able to live in the moment. You get so much power because it gives you power over yourself. I work with people in therapy all the time and they come in and you know what the biggest thing is? They want to change somebody else. Husband wants to change a wife. Father wants to change a kid. Kid wants to change a parent. The only person that you're ever going to change on this planet, if you're lucky, is yourself. That's not easy to do. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes self-control. And that's something that takes work. And when you dive in and you come into shul, this is your gym. I remember talking about this and people said, I don't have time to meditate. When am I going to go meditate? And I said, you're a firm person? He said, yeah. I said, you don't need to build in extra time. I said, when you dive in, that's for you to be able to practice your meditation. You don't have to put in extra time. Use the shul as your gym. Now, I want to talk a little bit now about some of the changes in my davening that have come about and give you an example of how mindfulness can affect Fila. When I started doing this, as I told you in the beginning, I wasn't sure that Judaism coincided with mindfulness. So what did I do? I went to Mishnah. And that guy who called me up and he asked me, he said, I think they thought it's Avodah Zorah, can you help me? I said, go to the first mission in the fifth parak of Brachos. They use the Lush on COVID Rosh. It says a person can stand to daven until he's in a state of mind called COVID Rosh. You know what that is? I think it's mindfulness. They didn't have that word back then, but it means to be in a state of mind of thought. And they give an example to illustrate it. You know what their example was? They talk about this group of people called the Hasidim Rishonim. And the Mishnah tells us they used to spend one hour before davening, an hour before that, they didn't rush in, put on this, rush to go. No, they spend an hour pr to prepare before davening. That's not being mindful. And the Gemara on the next daf tells us, the Talmud, the, the Rabbanon teach us, they didn't just spend an hour preparing, they spent an hour doing it, and an hour afterwards, and as if I couldn't do math, they tell us three times a day, Nine hours a day, they spent meditating. That's the Hasidim Yishonim. You know what that is? It's half your waking hours. You spend meditating. Imagine having a life like that. So when I started applying and looking and davening, I want to show you what I bumped into. You know, I wake up in the morning, and the first thing out of my mouth is this thing called Moda'ani. Did you ever notice what we say there? I put up a link on YouTube called Moda'ani. When you finish with this, take a look at what this really means. I'll give you a little sample. I get up in the morning, and I did this with Micha Kaufman. When I was visiting in Kessler, he gave me permission to use his name for this. He tells me, we wanted to learn. He says, we want to learn Davani. So we started with Moda'ani. And we realized that the word Moda not only just means thanks, but it also means to admit. Now imagine what you're doing in the morning. I just woke up. What's the first thing as a Jew that I'm doing? I'm saying thank you for what? Thank you very much, because right now, not everybody's having that privilege. So I thank you for giving me that ability. What am I admitting? I'm admitting first thing in the morning that I'm nothing Without you, everything I do, I admit, I need you. How do I know this? Look at what we say in the rest of Moda'ani. Bechem lo rabba emunasecha. God's giving us back our soul. And the word rabba has a double meaning there. It could be taken on both ways. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving us our souls. He's trusting us. He has faith in us that we're going to do right. How is he going to do right? 
Reish is Chochma, Yiras Hashem. What do those words mean? Reish is Chochma. Before wisdom has a place to land, it only lands on people that have Yiras Hashem. Seichel Tov L'chol Oseyem. Everybody gets common sense. But Chochma, wisdom, that's for only the people who have Yiras Hashem. And then I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I wake up in the morning, I'm talking about chokhmah, mindfulness. I'm talking about seichel, mindfulness. I haven't gotten a bed yet. Do you think mindfulness and Judaism have something to do with each other? And then I said, let me go further in Davani. Let me check out something. So I go to that whole list of brachos that we say. You know what the first bracha is? I don't think it's really talking about a rooster. Because the word sechvi, I think, has another meaning. It has to do with your brain. So now I don't have just Chochmah that I'm working with in Seichel, but right away I'm talking about Bina. And what is Bina to do? To be able from the word Bain to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. That's what Bina gives us. And then all of a sudden I said, wow, that's pretty cool. I said, let's look in Shimon Esrei. Well, let's go take a look there. Does mindfulness go there? I don't know. Do you know what I found out? Shmon Esrei has three parts to it. The first part, we praise God. The next part, we have a lot of bakosha, a lot of requests. What's the first one? The first computer system, it used to have the word das in the corner when you opened it up. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives to us Das, but look at what he gives us. What do we ask for? As Ashkenazim, we ask for Deo, Bina, and Seichel. What's missing? We don't ask for Chachma? All I want from God is Deo, Bina, and Seichel? I can't ask for Chachma. You know why? HaKol Bidei Shamayim Chutzmei Yirat Shomayim. And we just said in Moda'ani, Reish is Chochma, Yiras Hashem. If you don't have Yiras Hashem, I can't ask God for Chochma. I have to work to be able to first get that. Now, how far do we do that? That's another, that's another YouTube video that's about to come down the road. But we recognize that we need HaKadosh Baruch Hu to get through the day from the second we wake up in the morning. Now, I want to put a couple more to feel us, and I know there's going to be time for a few questions. As I went through Davani, you know what I realized is going on now? We lament so much about what we can't do because we're sent to our rooms now. Do you know what we're now first doing in Tefillah that we can't do when we're at Tzibor? I can't do Kaddish, I can't do Kedush, I can't do Tachman. But what am I saying now before Kriyat Shema? That when I'm in a Tzibor, I can never, ever say. Because I should or I shouldn't be saying Amen, that's for another YouTube. But what I do say, and everybody agrees, is when you're davening B'yechidus, what's the only thing you're thinking about? Kel, Melech, Ne'eman. And when you look in davening in Shmon Esrei, where does the word Ne'eman come up? Only in two places. V'ne'eman ato l'hachayos meisim and rofei ne'eman. When we're sitting here in a time of crisis, when people are dying all around us, and we focus on kel, melech, ne'eman, we need to recognize HaKadosh Baruch is in charge. He's the melech. This isn't just happening. There's a gentleman, a friend of mine, his name is Joel Richter, who gave me a little text a little while ago that puts things into perspective. There's a little quote that's in the name of Rav Hutna, and I'm going to read it to you, because it sort of helps me understand what's going on right now. This quote from Rav Yitzchok Hutna about Davani. The purpose of prayer is not to get us out of trouble. The purpose of trouble is to get us into prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This is a time and an opportunity that we have as we sit here alone, because we're not yet ready to go back out. Open up your sitter. Let's take davening to another level. So when we come back together and we start saying Kiddusha, we can actually learn to be like the angels. I want to end with two more Dere Torah, both coming from Daven. One of them has to do with something we say right after Baruch Hu. It always puzzles me. Right after Baruch Hu in the morning, we say, Yotze or Uvore Choshech, Ose Shalom Uvore Es HaKol. It's not supposed to be Es HaKol, because in Yeshayahu it's Ose Ra. And right afterwards, we get in and we say, Uvetuvo Bechadesh Bechol Yom Tom. Now, I'm a little confused. I always thought that God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. And I figured he went on vacation. He's down in the Caribbean somewhere. Or maybe he's on Mars in a nicer place than we are here. But what I realized is that God in his humility, he didn't just create the world and leave. God is machadesh hamechadesh betuvo. Later on in Davening, we flip the words. In the beginning, it's uvetuvo mechadesh. Later on, we recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is HaMechadesh Betuvo, Bechol Yom Tomi. Do you know what that means? That God every day looks down on this world and he says, he's a little tweaky. I think they need a little virus because they've been doing a little too many a virus. And I think maybe they need to go back for a time out so that when they go back outside, they'll learn that they need to put the tzibor before the yachid. Because right now, we are living in a world, you know, and I don't want to get political, but we live in a world where we have the right to carry guns, you know that? But when you have the right to social safety, which comes first? Do I have to carry a gun that's going to blow down a building? Yeah, we have rights. You know, I have rights as a teenager to go down on spring break in the middle of a virus. And I, yeah, I got the right. This is my time of life. I heard interviews that made me throw up and made me cry. Because here, these young people, for the time of their life, they're then leaving and bringing virus to all the old people that also live down in Florida. You have rights. But the biggest right we have is Bechira. To have the choice to be able to use our freedom correctly. And right now, it means staying inside. I have one YouTube that's called Corona Time Out. Another one that's called The Cure. That's what we should have done a month ago, and this would have been over by now. We have to learn self-control, and we have to learn to act like the angels. I'm going to pick one more thing from davening, and then I'll take questions. There are three places in davening where we say Kedusha. One of them we can't say now, two of them we do. The first one that we say Kedusha is right after Baruch Hu, before we get to Shema. We all of a sudden go into a little mini Shema Esrei, and we say the following. I'm going to translate and give you a little meaning. We're talking about the angels. They do Kedusha in heaven as well. But listen to how they do it and how they live. Now, first, I want to tell you two different things between angels and us. Number one, they don't have the hero. We do. They don't have free will. God creates them, they're there to serve his needs. They're individuals, they don't have groups. They may go together as two or three to do a mission, but each one of them is a yachid. You notice the difference between the word yachid and yachad? It's one little yud. We have to learn to take the yachid and we need to learn the yachad like the angels do. Look at what they do. What do they take from each other? Not their money. They take the burden. They share the all, one from the other. And what do they give to each other? They don't give headaches to each other. They don't give criticism to each other. They give permission to be. You're an individual. Why? 
That's what our job is. We're here to be able to bring Kedusha to this world if we only let each other be and not walk around criticizing each other constantly because your yarmuk is not like mine and your tzitzes have chelis and mine don't. What are we doing to each other? We fight sometimes about issues that are rabbinic issues and we violate Torah law of your hafta l'reya Why? If we just acted more mindfully, took a minute to think before we talked. I'll just wait one second. I have this in my office. I'm going to read it to you, but I guide my life by this. It says, before you speak, let your words pass through three gates. The first gate, is it true? The second, is it necessary? And the third, is it kind? I might have something to say, it might be true, but I might have to hold it back because you don't really need to hear it right now. And even if you need to hear it, I need to take another minute to figure out how to say it so it doesn't hurt you. If we can only accept each other's burdens and give each other permission to be, I think we'll be able to come out of our rooms and to go back as a tzibor. And hopefully we'll be able to be also in Any questions? It's up to you. Okay, so what I've learned, um, thank you to Jason David for your help, is that I needed to have uh, set the hand raising thing. So if you have questions, I'm actually going to ask you to type them into the chat at, down at the bottom of your screen. You should see a little speech bubble that says chat. And you can type your questions in there. And if you'd like, Rabbi Frankel, I'm happy to read them aloud for you. That would be great. And guys, you have a choice. If you don't have questions, I just go on to talk about stuff. So it's up to you. Come on, somebody's got to have a question. Go ahead, I got one over there. I think that's from Joel, the guy who gave me Rav Hutna. Joel, Joel, let me unmute you. Hang on one second. Phil um, said no question. Okay. Okay. If nobody has a question, I'll continue. And if you want, Elise, if you get somebody together and you get a chat, we'll go. You okay. I told you before about one of the principles that I lived my life by was this notion that's the thought that counts. And what I realized that that only applies to Davin. It really takes a lot of effort to be able to put the thought into it and to really know what the words mean in order to make them come alive. Otherwise, what's happening is all we're doing is we're just mumbling. We're just saying stuff and we're shuckling and we're doing things, which I'm not saying shouldn't be done. If that's the best that you got, then we'll do it. But I don't think we're reaching the deepest level until we really understand. When I, when I had the YouTube things that I put up, I put up examples of ways that davening and what we're saying can really make a difference. To just be able to notice that the word da'as, bina, seichel, and chachma wasn't there. I'm 67 years old. I just realized that a few months ago. It's embarrassing. And one of the, one of the places that I went to when I did a talk, I was talking about the bracha. I asked in the audience, I said, what's the most often said bracha achrona? And people were looking around, and one guy raised his hand. He said, it's a barin of fashos. And I said, yeah, you're right. I said, do you know what the words mean? And he, he sits back down, and I look around, and everybody's looking at each other. And I said, okay, let me help you out a little bit over here. And if you realize what's going on in that bracha, it's mind-boggling. Because what are we saying? We're telling Hashem, we're giving him credit. Besides, after we say, yeah, you're the king and all this other great stuff, which we always say, we say, you create all of these souls. But listen to the next five words. What are you, Toyota? 
You put out millions of cars and they don't have brakes. Their engine's broken. This guy's got dyslexia. That guy's got a heart problem. What are you doing? You're a perfect creator. Why would you create all these beings and create every one of them with chesronos? Did anybody notice that? This 83-year-old man came over crying after that talk. He said, I come from a family of Rabbanim. He said, I'm not a ger, and I'm not a Baal Shuva. I've been saying that bracha probably 10,000 times in my life, and I never realized that that's what that meant. The He says, what's that all about? Why would God do that? And I said, you know why? Because God is a giver. And if God created all of us with perfect, then we won't come back to him. Kaddish Baruch Hu recognizes that when do we come back? When we need him. So he creates us with needs. Why? Baruch HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows what he's doing. All of the stuff that we have and all of the stuff that we don't have is for purpose. We may not appreciate that. We may not realize that, yeah, I can't say, we can bemoan all the things we don't have. One of the things I think we're going to start realizing is to appreciate things a lot more after we come out. I think we're going to learn to appreciate each other a lot more when we come out. I'm hoping when we come into shul, we'll be looking at the sitter more than we're going to be looking at our watches. That's the hope. And I think that this is, this is a magaifa. There was one of the YouTube videos I put up, and I was trying to be very philosophical, and I almost referred to this as a nace. Because at the time, what was happening was it was only the old sick people. Not that that's good, but I said, if God wanted this to be a real maka, then the babies and this. And now look what's happening. We're finding, I heard today, there was a 30-year-old healthy guy who played baseball who got this, and with a matter of days, it was over. So this is a magaifa. We have to see it what it is. But we got to realize that this is an opportunity. We got to change our behavior. This is the time we have to self-reflect. And instead of bemoaning what we don't have, if we realize what we do have, there are things that are going on right now with people who are connecting. I've been getting calls from relatives that I haven't spoken to in years, from friends that I've lost touch with. I've, I've been sitting here going through the sitter in a way that I never have before. So hopefully when I get back, it'll make a lot more sense to me. It's hard to be in a davening in a language that most of us don't understand, to do it in a time period that most of us are rushed to get through. We need to commit to give the time necessary. I can't tell you some of the shyness I got a few weeks ago. There was a gentleman in one of the shuls who had Yurtzai on Rosh Chodesh. And it took him a little long to daven. And people were coming over to him. They said, Rabbi, you think that's right? And I said, the thing, what's right? Do you know that I'm missing my bus because of that? That's when buses were running and he was still going into work. He said, I'm going to miss my bus because of this. And people were walking out and missing Musaf because of that. Do you think that's fair? And I said, you want to ask you a question. Do you think it's fair that you came in here and you didn't leave enough time to put in the attention necessary so that this man who once a year gets up there to say Kaddish for his father can have the dignity to do that and not be criticized? Do you think that's fair? I'm not here to criticize anybody. I've been like this for years. I'm 67. This took me a long time to figure out. I look on the screens from some of the people I'm seeing, you're way younger than me. There's a lot more hope. And when I started this, I said, I'm talking to the choir. Anybody who tunes in right now, you got a lot more important things to do, no? I guess not. Davening means that much to you. You didn't turn it on for me. You turned it on because you wanted to be inspired a little bit. I know you're shaking your head, you turned it on for me. No, you didn't. You turned it on because you wanted to learn more about that. And that's my hope. Now, if anybody has a question now, Eliza, is there still anything? There, there are no questions, but I have a question for you. Please. Okay. When you enter your physical space of tefillah, whether it's at home or in shul, how do you turn off the world and turn off your stressors and turn off everything that's on your mind 
to just focus on that? So let me tell you, it's built into our tradition. I put on this thing called a talus. Okay, so I don't have that. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's your right. You don't have, you, you, let me tell you something, and I'm not poskening Shilas here. No. Women are not high of a mitzvah saseh shazman grama. I don't think that means that it's also to do. That's your choice. You're so given the ability to not do it. I'm not recommending, by the way, I'm not recommending you, but you don't have to. Women are on a higher madrega. You don't need a talus to get well, in a place where I need to go. I need a talus. I need to it. I need to remember that I have to tie my hand to my heart and to my head. You don't need that. That comes naturally to you. Okay? But all you need to do is you need to find that place inside of you that I need to cover myself up with, with my talus. And I need my tefillin to be able to remind me that it's all about my heart and my soul and my mind. And I start saying these words and all of a sudden they come alive. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm looking in the chat. There's nothing. Oh, here we go. From Ira. To enhance Kavana with the minion, should a person aim to finish Shmona Esrei when the Chazan finishes? Okay. That's an awesome question. There's a lot of shyness about this. Let me tell you what mindfulness teaches me. When it comes to living in the moment, we literally have to make choices. Hard choices. I'm watching a good football game and my wife calls and says, I'm going to be home in three minutes. Can you help me with the groceries? I got to tell you, that's a hard choice, especially if it's a Super Bowl game. Okay. Life is not easy. Okay. When I'm in the middle of my own Shimon Esrei and I'm hearing the Chazen all of a sudden starting, what am I supposed to do in that moment? I'm not supposed to rush my Shimon Esrei to catch up with him because that's not being mindful. What mindful means is that when he starts his Shimon Esrei, what I may do is I may stop mine so that I can be listening to his tefillah on behalf of the Tzibor, at least until through Kedusha. And then after Kedusha, I can resume my davening when he's bad, and then I can join him hopefully at the end. That's what I would recommend. Now, if a person can work with their tefillah so that they can speed things. Look, let me tell you something. The more I'm finding I'm davening, you don't have to slow it down to make it meaningful. You may have to slow it down for a certain period of time. That's like riding a bike. You know, when I first started, I fell off a lot. It was it. And then all of a sudden, zoom, I was going. And it's, you know, you can get to a place where you can actually join along. But this is not a race. Davening is designed for each person individually even though you're in a tzibor, you're still there as an individual. Davin, you're Shimon Esrei, and then when you catch up with them, you catch up. Uh, if that doesn't answer a question, by the way, please let me know. Elisa, did I answer yours? You did. Ira, did I answer yours? He may be typing his answer, I'm not sure. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, he says, yes, you did. Uh, any other questions? I don't see any coming through just yet. I don't know if somebody's typing. If people have questions which they'd like to submit to you privately, is there an email? 100%. Address? Yes. So let me, let me tell you a couple of things. First, as I said before, I've been using my time. Somebody said, you know, you got a good time. Why don't you figure out how to get online? So for two days, I must have deleted about 14 videos in the process, but I did finally get stuff onto YouTube. So that's one place where people, I guess, can put comments and stuff, and I can react that way. I'll give you my email, which is probably the best way. It's reb, R-E-B-S-F, my initials, 18 at yahoo.com. So people can certainly reach me through that. Uh, and if they want to call, you know, one of the things that I, Lisa, I had this with you for a while too. People use these things like texting and this and that. When all it takes is a phone call and we can solve it in one minute, but we spend three weeks going back with texting and emails until we finally can conclude something. So if you want to text me and you want to talk, I'll give you my phone number. We can do that too. Uh, but I'm open to being able to hear it. Now, one of the things that I'm hoping to do is, for example, Moda Ani, I already put up on YouTube. My goal is, Eliza is to get into schools. I want to get this into yeshiva. 
and retrain people how to learn davening the way I think it should be. It should be taught by words, knowing what they mean, not just by rote and not just shuffling. I would love to be able to teach kids how to live in the moment because when they do that, they make better choices. I'm working right now with a school undercover where one of their directors is already doing mindfulness, but the principal's not so cool on the idea yet. So I said, you know what? You just keep notes on what you're doing. And then in six months, we'll sit down and we'll talk to the principal after you've shown the changes. It's mind boggling to be able to slow. Imagine what kids can do when they stop in the moment. And instead of throwing something or yelling, she says, kids are now talking to each other. They're now talking about feelings like they never did before. Imagine how that can translate into adulthood, into marriages. So all of this mindfulness of what I talk about, it's sort of selfish. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, by the way, does not need our tefillah. You sometimes walk into shul with a big knock, what am I going to... You're not getting anything. You're giving, just like Kobanos. It's avoda. When we come in, it's not about getting, it's about giving. When you're standing there and you finished your own davening and you decide to talk to your neighbor when 12 other people are davening, it's like turning your back on the tzibur. That's the kind of mindfulness that I want to bring in. When we make decisions in the moment, then we have an opportunity, we have more time than ever now, to be able to slow down and to think things through. And if we put that into davening, you can spend an hour and a half now on mincha. Okay. Thank you very much, Rabbi Frankel. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my we pleasure. We just got, uh, just wanted to read this comment to you here from Sarah Burson. Yeah. Thank you so much for an insightful sheer. After years of trying to get my mind to stop wandering as I dive in, I see how mindfulness is a clear solution to enhancing my tefillah. Oh my gosh. Who said oh, that? Sarah Burson. I what love you. Well, that's so sweet. What a way to end. Thank you so much. Oh, Everybody, beautiful. stay healthy. And have a chag kosher v'sameach. Chag kosher v'sameach. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.